For Criminal Media's Policy, I'm Sane Lamini. Journalist and writer Stephen Tim is in conversation with Policy about his book titled At Any Cost, the South African fraud star who took the tech world for more than $40 million. So Stephen, can you briefly tell us how Israeli South African fraud star now Iran Eyal scammed people out of over $40 million through his million dollar cryptocurrency startup that was called a shopping. Basically, he uh, falsified information relating to his various startups. There were actually three in the end, Spring Leap, uh, another company called Paso, which Paso actually became a uh, shop in. And all these things relied on, you know, to get investment in as a tech startup, you pitch, you, you send material to investors and all these things you can twist, you can straight out lie, like you would put big names out there and say these people invested, you know, in, in emails or LinkedIn messages. And these people never, like Facebook's number six employee, Nicholas Hyman, the guy, this one and another few names. People just never, these people never invested $100,000 or whatever it was. Um, one of the kind of the most interesting things is you've got a Bulgarian guy to web scrape, uh, which is basically going through a certain website or certain websites and room and taking out all these profiles. So he friendly was the first uh, company that was running there that he founded with uh, someone else who then took a back seat. And then he went to the US. And this was a crowdsourcing platform for market experts and designers. So instead of going to an advertising agency, you can get all these people through sort of like a Facebook, you know, for people that are experts on say like the Nigerian market or the Romanian market or the South African market or whatever it is. And initially they had about 2000 names and then they started saying they had 9,000 or something. And then next thing he said, ah, the 180,000, um, names that we have on this list. But meanwhile, these weren't people that he built up the list. He, he got someone just to take it off Fiverr, a, a website for freelancers. And then he did things like he put logos on, um, which this is for, for, for his company shopping where he raised, I mean, even bigger amounts, 42 and a half million US dollars in a, in a cryptocurrency ICO, which is like a, like an IPO, but you know, through the blockchain or in this case, uh, equivalent with ether and um there you'd have pitch decks saying things like you know when it said who is who's invested in shopping and um logos were there the google logo was there and the, and another big company called Softdoc was there as well and meanwhile all that had happened was um it was employees from this from these companies from these respective companies google employees or Softdoc employees or a Softdoc employee who'd invested in Paso, which then became shopping you know, that's distorting because um, most people would think, oh, that's Google that's invested. Oh, wow, it must be a big company. There's so many other examples. All these, these scams like this kind of rely on, um, you know, this big person is in the company and you'd have a big brand name associated with that person. But like you'd say, um, you know, for example, for shopping, oh, Michael Herman is from who's worked with all these massive designers. He's in the company. Meanwhile, the guy left like, like a few months before, but they left his name on the pitch deck. Now, that's clever because you can always come out later and say, oh, uh, sorry, I forgot to take the name off, which is actually what happened with Vinnie Lingen. He's a South African entrepreneur that's he's now there in the U.S. for quite a few years. Oh, um, okay. Anyway, he, he was an advisor to Paso, which then became dropping. And um, okay. at one time he said, please remove me from your pitch decks because I don't want, mm. um, I don't want to be an advisor anymore to uh, cryptocurrency. I'm actually taking a back seat here for the cryptocurrency. Uh, yeah. advisory role down there. Mm. And, and then he said, no, then Aaron, I mean, he showed me the message, messages. He said, no problem, I'll take you off. Meanwhile, he just kept on, he, he kept on using his name. Now that's fraud. He needed Vinny's name there because Vinny had just raised 30 or something, 33 million US dollars through mm. an ICO for his company. And so he needed that association. Mm. So these are just some of the examples of, um, it's very easy. You know, the book is almost like a recipe. If you want to carry out a fraud in, in the in the tech yeah. sector, no yeah. one's coming. In, in most of these okay, instances, so. unless you really, really dig deep, you're not going to catch on that this is all rubbish. Another one he said is like the company's Springly is the seventh most innovative company in the world. And he yeah. got that from um, at one time Springly was featured in a fast company 
magazine, but the South African mm. version. So there's very there's quite a few versions of Fast Company magazine, the, mm. the South African version. And in yeah. the South African version, uh, you know, when I got hold of that publication, I could see, okay, there was like 25 top global companies. And then there was a South African one for 20 other companies. Now, guess where Spring Leap was listed? Under the South African one. But he dropped yeah. that South African thing and said, if it is the seventh most innovative company in wow. South Africa, he said, no, in the world. Now, that's, again, you, you can always say, oh, yeah. I, I, I made a typo. Mm-hmm. Very clever, you see. Yeah. <laughs> in the investigation that, that the New York Attorney General's office carried out, they wanted to prove like, that he actually had intent. Like, these weren't just mere administrative errors. And what they did find in the end, because they had access to, you know, when they do a grand jury on you, they have access to all your like electronic records and stuff. So if this investigator found like a Robin Hood, uh, it's an investment company, they found a statement of his that he'd actually manipulated. He'd actually he'd get a get an apartment in this big swanky apartment in in um, Williamsburg, where he said, which is like quite a it's like a bohemian area, like Woodstock. Uh, Observatory in Cape Town to get into that multi-million place, he had to show like you know because an entrepreneur doesn't have a regular income, but to show his investment account, and he just added an extra zero. Now the, the they show in the court records um, the actual printout. If they compare the two, this is the original, this is the fake one. Look, this, this is the same, and he did it again. He did it twice. A friend of his was moving into an apartment and needed someone to stand surety, so he said no problem, and he'd done this before, so he just I don't know. Now that's intent. You know, when someone does that, you know, okay, this guy's definitely a fraudster. There's no admin error here. I mean, you actually have to think about how am I gonna how am I gonna manipulate this so that it doesn't look that it looks very faithful to the original. So yeah, there you have it. What drew you to his story? And have you met him before? Yeah, I met him uh, about 2010. I met him when I was doing an interview with a business colleague of mine. Um, we were just doing interviews about fast growing companies. And um, at that time, you know, I walked away and it struck me as, wow, what a gentle, calm, intelligent guy. And then, you know, eight years later, 2018, the news broke that he'd been arrested and he was now failed at, at Rikers Island for three, three weeks. Um, I thought it couldn't be the same person. And, you know, I, I've, I've been working at VentureBurn, which is a publication in the tech uh, startups in South Africa and Africa for uh, you know a year and a half or so by that time and I've come across so many examples of tech entrepreneurs that actually there's a term that is, that is it, I don't know they, 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 they smoke and mirrors they talk up the company you know it's called the fake until you make it syndrome um, where it's pretty much easy to move from this to what Aaron Eyal was doing Aaron Eyal was just sort of doing what everyone else was doing except he was conning investors it wasn't just over talking. It was actually full of life. At that time, the court case got underway. And the court case initially only focused on Springley, but then they turned their attention to shopping when um, and one of the employees that used to work there cooperated with the authorities and said, hey, there's, there's the same sort of stuff that's going on here at this new company. And, and I was also uncovering stuff. So while they were doing the investigation, they were reading my stories and they were like, hey, this is... Uh, it's interesting. In the end, I thought, you know, there's, there's a book here. It's like a wolf on Wall Street. There's, there's so much back in back story that people don't know about that I kind of got obsessed with the story. Like someone actually told me who worked there that I, I was the uh, I was like his nemesis. I was uh, when Iran went to bed at night, he would think about me. He would be like, "What's this guy gonna write on me next?" I was. <laughs> it wasn't like sort of, um, you know, I. I, I I wasn't going after him in that way, but it was it was what he represented. What he he represented like the bad side of the tech sector, and, and I thought that had to be written about because no one else was. Everyone is writing about, wow, Sada, he had to save the world. But what they don't tell you about is you know, the lies, uh, the ego. There's a lot of that in that in the sector, and I thought apart from it being a a gripping story, um, the side has to come through because the startup, the media that covers the startup sector, are they just like conduits. They're like conduits for these startups. Whenever they want it, they write press release, they get they pay PR agencies to write it, write their stuff and it comes out. There's no independent 
uh, articles, a oh, few, few, there are some, but most of them are like sort of, because these guys need media um, to, you know, to, to, so they can raise the next 20 million US dollars or whatever they want to raise. Some of the people who knew him before he moved to New York did not even describe him as a scammer. So what changed when he moved to New York, if you may tell us? Well, I mean, I later had a conversation with a school friend of him after the book came out. Must have been about three weeks ago. So um, this guy was scamming people in some or other way already from his school days, you know, after. It's just that he, he hadn't gone the global stage. And the book kind of goes into, you know, why at the end, like, why did he do this? And it touches on um, his relationship with his, I mean, where these things always start, like, you know, family. And uh, he kind of lived in the shadow of his very successful brother, Avi Yael, who's now a venture capitalist, um, lives in Israel. Iran was actually born in Israel, but he, the family moved to uh, South Africa, to Durban, when he was one year old. So he grew up in Durban and then about 2006 or seven, he, he moved down to, to Cape Town for a few years. And then he, he found himself in the US in about 2014, 2013. And that's kind of, it's kind of like when he went to the US, things hit a new level. I think it was about 2015 or something, he, he shaved his head. He had a, he always had a receding hairline, you know? Um, and, and he was never someone, the photos from Cape Town, you know, I cruised his Facebook account because he was strangely carried on as a friend of mine on Facebook, like a, a friend connection on Facebook. He never blocked me on Facebook. He, he blocked me on LinkedIn, but never on Facebook. So I could see the image, the, the, the photographs painted a, a good picture of like how this, he had a very laid back personality uh, before he got to the US. Suddenly in the US, he was kind of this very like clean chairman. He got like more expensive looking glasses. He, just, he started wearing like tailored sort of clothing and suits and stuff. And it was almost like he was, trying so hard to be this person that I suppose he never was cut out to be. And hence the, the title at any cost, he, he wanted to get there. And that's why he raised this um, ICO. Uh, I think he thought that he was shooting the roof out at that time. Just, you know, it was all it was based on two pilot projects that never happened and a whole lot of other lies and things. You could see him cracking under pressure as well. Um, and, and sort of the toll that I suppose anyone in business that is trying to succeed at any odds, it, it, it have, it, what it does to you, um, you know, like hardly sleeping, taking drugs, cocaine and all that kind of stuff, you know, thinking that the drugs are pushing through to like a new level. So, you know, in a way, you know, you feel sorry for the guy. He, he was, yeah, he, he, he was cracking big time. <laughs> And he, he was arrested while he was traveling to Singapore to, to meet his investors. Yeah. And part of the meeting now uh, was also to allay the rumors uh, about his investment. Can you tell us about that? I mean, the book opens with a scene where he was mm. arrested. So this got all called to me by various insiders, ex-employees. But the story is yeah, that he raised this 42 and a half million US dollar uh, ICO in, by the time it closed, the Bitcoin Ether price had just started clipping down. So the forty-two and a half million dollars was what what it was, what was the value of the Ether as it came in. As soon as the ICO ended, apparently, you know, according to one um, shopping employee, it was worth only six million US dollars. So now suddenly, he only had six million. Uh, but everyone, they didn't tell that to anyone because he. Uh, kind of embarrassing and also you wanted to talk up the thought up you wanted to get more he was constantly raising more investment he needed to raise i think it was a million and a half or something he was trying to raise from some investors in singapore if you follow his telegram account um for shopping where he was every day he was telling investors what's going on he was developing an app that you're going to different retailers right now you started with with fashion you know you go into a store you don't know what to buy now all you want is say you like hawaiian shirts you you just want an app or something that you just see like all the different hawaiian shirts available to you and like the matching slip slops or shorts or panama hats or whatever that goes with that 
You want to see that across all retailers, but you can't. You have to go to Nike, yes, they want, everything is siloed. And then if you go to Amazon, yeah, they have all of it there. But then basically those retailers are just a page on Amazon. So this app was going to be a brilliant solution to like the problem with retail in globally, especially in the US. Um, the, the retailers would pay a certain prescription fee to belong to the app. And, and adver advertising would go inside, instead of you getting emails or like it's a message or something, which people are just like, ah, oh, spam. Using the special shopping token, which was <clears throat> backed by Ether, they would pay you. The, the retailer had all the tokens, the shopping tokens, they would pay you. And with those shopping tokens, you could then use it back into, the, into their stores. They pay you for advertising, which is a different way of thinking. Anyway, a brilliant um, solution, but they just never, they didn't find one client. They never, no one saw the product is apparently on GitHub being developed. But like investors, and there were 4,000 people that invested in, in shopping, right? Like normal retail investors, uh, like you're like a person that works at a bank or as a lawyer or something, like middle class people from different countries. Not in the US, he claimed, because in the US, that kind of stuff needs to be controlled. So, yeah, he got arrested at the airport, um, literally charged and taken straight to, was charged in Brooklyn, taken straight to Rikers Island. So now, Stephen, his scam affected a lot of people, as, as you've just told us as well. Can you briefly now share how it affected the people that he managed to recruit to his investment? How were they affected financially? In Spring Leap, they were angel investors. He didn't go to any venture capitalists. Those angel investors, you know, they, they're wealthy individuals, and they used to, like, just throwing $100,000 or $200,000 or $30,000. Oh, it's, it's risky money. If they never see a return on that, okay, they must accept that. There were four that uh, they were in the US. I mean, he got probably three million US dollars uh, in total for Springly um, <clears throat> from investors. But it was only the four investors that were in the US that, that reported him to the New York Attorney General's office. And that was after the company closed down um, because he said, oh, he ran out of funds. Oh, why? And then the investors found out that he'd just been siphoning off funds for his, his own personal use. He'd go to uh, the Caribbean or Paris or for like trips that's paid by investors' money. Gym costs and money that he sent his mother. I mean, stuff that shouldn't come out of the investment accounts. So these wealthy individuals, I mean, they weren't, they're not going to go, I don't think they're going to go, and they're not going to go into bankruptcy or something. The point is more that many of those people, they were really angry, you know, because Rich or poor, you know, if someone does that to you, you feel it's one of the worst things you can do. But be betrayed like that for such a long time uh, and laid on it makes you feel like an idiot. The people that were working for him claimed they, they weren't in on the scam. They were just strung along. He was fooling everyone. Is this book now a great guide, if I may ask, for people wanting to invest in the cryptocurrency? Not really a guide, no. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it does give you a sense of what can go wrong. Um, okay. And look, that's a that's a different kind of cryptocurrency investment. I don't think you see too many of those types in South Africa because what they were actually doing was they were developing a product. Whereas what's quite common in South Africa and also in the world right now is is actually crypto investing. You give them say ten thousand rand, they turn that into various different you know it can be bitcoin and ether and then they say okay there's different funds where we can put it it's just like you go to a, a unit trust it's like that they they'll invest it on on your behalf whereas the shopping one was oh they're developing this app and they're going to use ether was like the fuel the, the, the token that they're going to so you buy ether with your cash you buy ether and then Ether will buy you so many shopping tokens. And those shopping tokens can only be used within that ecosystem of, of shopping app. Um, that's where you, where you raise that kind of money. It's called an initial coin offering. Where, but many of those things don't come off. Actually, estimates of like 80 to 90% of them don't come off and pretty much amount to scams. If you tell someone, 
I mean, you call them, you're going to develop this, and then it doesn't happen. It's why? Why is it? Why didn't it come off? So yeah, they, yeah. Maybe there's some. Maybe uh, investors can can get some insight into how these mm. ICOs work. Yeah. That was Stephen Tim in conversation with Polity about his book titled "Head and Coast: South African Fraudster Who Took the Tech World for More Than Forty Million Dollars."